I'm feeling a bit of deja vu doing this. Six years ago, I stood on a TEDx Toledo stage and called out killings by police officers as the death penalty on the streets. I explained that the use of fatal force by police officers is an ignored, unprincipled, and ultimately unconstitutional form of the death penalty. It was then, and still is, my hope that if we acknowledge death at the hands of police officers as a sentencing issue, then we can talk about the safeguards that are usually applied to the death penalty in the court system and apply those sorts of safeguards to when police officers use fatal force on the streets. So things like the protection against being executed when punish that punishment would be disproportionate, arbitrary, or when it would be applied in an inhumane manner. Now, at the time I delivered that talk, it was just one month after a police officer had executed Michael Brown on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. In two months, since Eric Garner was killed, executed by police officers for selling loose cigarettes on the streets of Staten Island. Now, as I deliver this talk today, it's been 13 months since Elijah McClain was executed by police. 11 months since Tatiana Jefferson was executed by police. Six months since Breonna Taylor was executed by police. Three months since George Floyd was executed by police. And one month since Trayvon Pellerin was executed by police. And there have been so, so many others in the years and the months in between. Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Botham Jean, India Kager, Geraldine Townsend, Stefan Clark, Daniel Prude, all from the death penalty on the streets. But what I've come to realize through an endless stream of media coverage and social media posts and trending hashtags is that what's happening to Black people across the country every day is not only the death penalty on the streets. Because sometimes the victims of this violence aren't killed. Sometimes they're shot seven times in the back, but survive. And sometimes the terror isn't at the hands of police. Sometimes the victim is chased down while jogging by a group of white men claiming to effectuate a citizen's arrest. Sometimes the victim is an avid bird watcher out for a walk or a couple of friends waiting in a coffee shop for a meeting or a tired student resting in a dormitory common area. And someone decides that they don't belong where they are and that they deserve to be punished for their presence. This is not just the death penalty on the streets. It's sentencing on the streets. And when it comes to living while Black in America, where Blackness is the nuisance, we as Black people are just presumed punishable. I know you've all heard of the presumption of innocence. It's considered one of the most sacred principles of the American criminal justice system. The longstanding protection that a defendant is innocent until proven guilty. In other words, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that each material element of the crime, of the crime charged has actually happened. This is a fundamental due process requirement and due process is a constitutional requirement. So before we ever get to the punishment phase of a crime, of a case, the suspected individual has to be charged with a crime. And because they're protected by the presumption of innocence, the government has the burden to prove to a judge or to a jury, which has, and the judge or jury has to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant actually committed every element of the crime being charged. Now, once that defendant pleads guilty, which sometimes happens, or if they're convicted of the charge, then it's only after that conviction or that admission of guilt that we then move to the punishment phase. So what's happening outside of the courts on the streets every day to Black people in America is that self-proclaimed prosecutors, juries, and judges are skipping straight to punishment. When you're, when you're sentenced on the street, 
you're just presumed punishable. There's no crime charged. And the only one who has to be convinced of your guilt is the person inflicting the punishment or calling the police to do it for them. You know, sure, people can, and maybe in some cases even should, call the police when they feel they're in danger or they believe that a crime is being committed. And of course, the police are empowered to arrest individuals if they, if they have probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those far too, in, too often instances when police are called to punish people because it's just presumed that punishment is necessary. Let me give you an example. In a story reported in 2018, when a Yale student at, when a white student at Yale called the police because a black woman was sleeping in a Yale dormitory common area, she said it was because, quote, there's someone who appeared they weren't where they were supposed to be. Thankfully, when the police showed up, they determined that this black woman was actually a Yale student who had every right to take a nap in the Yale dormitory common area. But to this white student, the black student's mere presence was punishable. When a person is presumed punishable, the presumption of innocence hasn't been afforded to them. They also lose another important aspect of the criminal process when this happens. In a criminal trial, the presumption of innocence also means that the defendant has no burden to produce evidence of their innocence. They don't have to prove that they were doing the right thing. Instead, the prosecution has to prove that the defendant was committing a crime. But when Black people are presumed punishable and sentenced on the streets, the media coverage and popular dialogue is all about what they were doing, whether they have a criminal record, a troubled childhood, did they comply with officers' requests, why were they there in the first place, why did they talk back, why didn't they just cooperate? As if to say, the if the person just hadn't been guilty of something, past or present, then things would have gone down differently they wouldn't have been sentenced. They wouldn't have been punishable. But the truth is, when you're presumed punishable just by your very existence, it doesn't matter what you do. You're never doing the right thing. You could be running away, standing still, hands up, hands on the steering wheel, reaching for an ID, reaching for a phone, lying on the ground gasping, I can't breathe, vomiting and apologizing, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, I can't breathe correctly. You could be approaching officers, you could have your back turned, you could be resisting or complying, you could be watching TV on your own couch, you could be asleep in your own bed. When sentencing is happening on the streets, there are no elements to prove, no elements of a crime to prove, because we skip right over the presumption of innocence, charges, a trial, a conviction. Instead, the punisher, whether it be a police officer or an everyday individual, acting on their anti-Black bias, that person has decided that it is their duty to inflict punishment on this Black person who rather than being presumed innocent, is presumed punishable. And then that same person who has acted as prosecutor, jury, and now judge, also decides then how much punishment is appropriate, whether it be just a good scare until you're let go, or ketamine to the veins, or a bag over your head while you suffocate or a knee to the neck. Now maybe this is where I should tell you that I'm a sentencing scholar. So for my job, in addition to teaching, I spend my time researching and writing about sentencing issues. So in my work, I examine the reasons why lawmakers, prosecutors, and judges seek to impose certain punishment for certain behaviors that have been deemed criminal. I'm well aware, due to my work, I'm well aware of the systemic racism that the criminal justice system has baked into it. 
criminal sentencing, and really the entire criminal justice system. And so I understand that sentencing in the courts is far from perfect. The Sentencing Project has reported that more than 60% of the people in prison today are people of color. Black men are six times as likely to be incarcerated as white men. And for black men in their 30s, about one in every 12 is in prison or jail on any given day. And this isn't because black people commit more crimes. It's because of anti-black bias. Studies have repeatedly shown this. They've shown us that even when convicted of similar offenses, black people receive longer punishment than their white counterparts or really people of any other races. And so this bias, it doesn't just affect judges and prosecutors and police officers. It affects all Americans. Implicit bias studies show us that the majority of Americans hold some sort of negative stereotypes against black people. And so when it comes to thoughts about race and crime, evidence shows that Americans over attribute criminal activity to black people. So also in a study by the Sentencing Project, it revealed that when asked about burglaries, illegal drug sales, juvenile crimes, that whites overestimated the percentage of those crimes committed by African Americans by as much as 30%. And then across races, people overestimated Black participation in crime by over 10%. Now, you know, this is no surprise. America was built for us to think this way, that Blackness needs punishment. That's why in 2020, we have to affirmatively state that Black lives matter because our history just doesn't, hasn't shown that they do. But even if this bias is explainable, that doesn't make it acceptable. And even though sentencing in the courts is infected with racism, at least when it happens in the courts, there's an opportunity for the charged person to make a plea, to make an argument about the appropriate sanction and sometimes an opportunity to argue that there's no sanction needed at all. But sentencing on the streets robs people of that opportunity. It robs them of any opportunity. The extent of their punishment, which could claim their very life, is in the hands of the one who presumed them to be punishable and worthy of punishment in the first place, worthy of whatever level of punishment that person sees fit as fitting. Now, it's not that the police or people on the streets just don't know how to be better. We know how to presume that people are not punishable. What does a presumption of innocence look like on the streets? Well, it looks like this. It looks like walking past police officers at an emotionally charged protest, holding an assault rifle, and having those police officers greet you, thank you, offer you water. Now that's an example where there were so, so many reasons to be suspicious and to question the behavior, but whiteness afforded a presumption of innocence. And so I have to be aware as a black person that when I walk out onto the streets, I'm going to be presumed punishable. I know this, I just cannot accept it. So what do we do? And I just wanna be clear, when I say we, I'm talking about I'm only talking about those of you who say that Black Lives Matter. So if you agree that Black Lives Matter, then you must understand that Black people are presumed punishable. And for their lives to really matter, to save Black lives, we have to strip away the power and tools of sentencing on the streets. Now this is what we do in the sentencing space, right? And this is really what calls for defunding the police are about. They're about shifting resources to the more appropriate places. And so in the sentencing reform space, rather than continuing to incarcerate at rates that outpace the rest of the world, sentencing reformers try to chip away at mass incarceration by reallocating resources to places where it makes sense. Alternatives to incarceration, diversion programs, early release support. None of it is perfect. Right, but it's recognizing that incarceration isn't always the right fix for every criminal justice issue, if it fixes anything at all. Similarly, we have to admit that policing isn't the right answer all the time. Racism is not going to go away today or tomorrow, but we can weaken its resources. 
When I walk out onto the streets and you see me and presume that I'm punishable, I wanna be sure that you don't have military-like force to exact that punishment on me. I wanna be sure that if you decide to call the police to be the punisher for you, that you'll be directed to a properly funded non-police service to deal with the danger that you think I'm posing or to properly address the dispute that you think we're having. And if the police do show up, I wanna be sure that they know that they won't be able to hide their decision to punish me under the blanket of qualified immunity or a reasonable fear or a no-knock warrant. They need to know that if, God forbid, they des decide to punish me, that they will be punished themselves if they don't give me the chance to be charged, properly charged, and to demand proof of those charges. If they decide to just skip over all of that and go straight to punishment, then they need to know that they'll be punished. I want to be sure that I won't just be another headline, another debated storyline, another trending hashtag. I want to be sure that police officers will know that they'll be punished if they act in a way that is presuming that people are punishable. Because when you're presumed punishable, it means that your punishers are not arrested, right? Because they're given the benefit of the doubt. It was just an accident. Well, they were acting reasonably. They were just doing their jobs. I don't know how to stop anyone from presuming that I'm punishable, from presuming that any Black person is punishable. But at least if you don't have the tools to make punishment decisions, to sentence me on the streets, at least then I can live to keep calling it out, to keep giving it a name. Others can live to keep working on it, to keep dismantling it. We can live, we can rest, we can breathe without being punished for it.